family. Good, good afternoon, my little Origin family. Uh, this afternoon, I, I want to express a special, special gratitude for um, our praise team. Let me tell you, um, I really appreciate you guys. Week after week, our band, um, I, as I was preparing for our message today, there was a section in the passage that described the great celebration. And I thought about you guys. I thought about how every single week, you know, you lead us into the presence of God. You invoke the spirit of God here. And I just want to thank our praise team. I'm very, very thankful, thankful for you guys. Really appreciate you. Opens up our hearts. Um, the passage that we're going to take a look at this morning was inspired by a conversation that I was having with, um, with Elkie. That always happens. That happens quite often. We were um, having, I was reading the passage and I put it down. I wasn't, um, I didn't finish taking a look at it. And then I went over to her house and the conversation came up and it really, really opened my mind to really take a look at this. And we're going to be looking this morning at 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Let's read this passage and then we'll have a word of prayer. 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. David, again, brought together all the able young men of Israel, 30,000. He and all his men went to Bala in Judah to bring up the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim on the ark. They set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, son of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the ark on it. And Ahio was walking in front of it. David and all Israel were celebrating with all their might that the Lord all their might before the Lord with castanets, harps, lyres, timbrels, sistrums, and cymbals. It was a big celebration. But when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out to hold the ark of God because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. God struck him down, and he died there beside the ark. Our message this afternoon is entitled, The Cause of Death. And I'd like for us to try to get to the bottom of why God had to kill Uzzah. Why did Uzzah have to die? Please join me for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this little family that you blessed us with in this little time together. We thank you for this day of rest, this day when we can disconnect from everything happening in the world, all the busyness and all the confusion, that we can break away and come together and just focus on you and hear from you, for you to be here, for us to experience your presence, talk to you, for us to lay our burdens at your feet. We just want to thank you for being here. We thank you for receiving our prayers. We know that that did not come cheap. We know that it came at a tremendous price, and we just want to thank you, Father, for all that you've done just for us to be here and enjoy this moment. We thank you, Father, for everything you do in the name of your Son, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You know, there's a, there's a great mystery, something that always puzzles me, and I don't know if you feel the same way, and I know you watch a lot of football, so... You might feel the same way. I always wonder, when two teams are about to play against each other, and they're both praying, which one of them is God rooting for? <laughs> you always wonder the same question, right? Which one of them is going to win? Which one of them is God rooting for? I always ask that. <laughs> now, I can't speak to God's involvement with sporting events. 
All right, I don't know. <laughs> Can never figure it out. Every team thinks that God is rooting for them. So everybody brings their game in prayer. So I can't speak to God's involvement in sporting events, but what I can speak to, because the Bible gives us countless examples, I can speak to God's involvement with wars that his people go to. When, peop when his people get involved with wars, the Bible gives us countless examples of God's intervention in those wars and how God gives his people the victory, and sometimes he doesn't. He gives his people the victory, and sometimes he doesn't. But what I know that God does not allow, God does not allow himself to be used as a good luck charm. God does not allow himself to be used as a rabbit's foot. On one occasion, the Israelites seemed to have made this foolish idea and they thought that God could be like a rabbit's foot. They had gone to war with the Philistines and they got their butt whooped. They lost about 4,000 men in that battle. So they thought to themselves, they said, you know what? You know the reason we lost? The reason we lost this battle is because we didn't have the Ark of the Covenant with us. So they got this bright idea that in their next battle, they would bring the Ark of the Covenant with them to battle. So they had requested for the Ark to be brought out of Shiloh to their camp. And when they brought it, they were very, very excited. Now, if you guys aren't clear on what the Ark of the Covenant is, I'll give you just a quick little snapshot of what it is. The Ark of the Covenant is a chest that God had instructed Moses to make. In the book of Exodus, we find the description of the Ark. The Ark is described as a lidded wooden chest covered with pure gold inside and out. And it had two cherubims on the top that were facing each other. And they were also made of gold. They were hammered out of gold. And the Ark contained four rings in it which were also covered in gold, and that was for the purpose of sticking some rods that were also made of gold, of wood and covered with gold, uh, in order to carry it. And the ark inside contains two stone tablets with the Ten Commandments, a pot of manna, and the rod of Aaron. God had instructed Moses to put this together, and he told Moses that this is where his presence would dwell. And between those two cherubim, this is where he would meet with Moses and give him instructions for the people. So this ark was pretty significant to the people of Israel. It was one of their most, it was really their most valuable possession. And they had decided that they're going to bring it to their next battle. And they requested for it to be brought out of Shiloh where it was. And they were really excited about that. They were so excited that they were just shouting for joy. They shouted for joy, and the Bible described it, that their shouts actually made the ground tremble. The earth was quaking because of how loud they were cheering and their excitement for the fact that the ark was now going to be going to war with them, and they thought for sure that they were going to win the next battle. Now, the Philistines on the other side caught wind of the fact that the Israelites had the Ark of the Covenant, and they were going to be bringing it to the next battle, so the Philistines were terrified. They were actually really scared. They had so much respect, and they felt like, my goodness, the, the Ark of the Covenant is coming to battle on this field. We better train hard. We better not let them lose, because if we, let, we, if we lose this battle, we're going to become slaves to the Hebrews. So they train hard, and guess what happened? They whipped the Israelites' butt. This time, they didn't only lose 4,000 soldiers. They actually lost 30,000 soldiers. They got beat. And you know what the worst part about this loss was? The Philistines stole. They took the Ark of the Covenant. You see, sometimes we as people of God can make the error of thinking that we can summons God like our little genie. We can summons God like our good luck charm. We can summons God like our rabbit's foot and use him for our purposes, for our glory, for our success, whatever we feel like we want. God did not instruct them to do that. They decided to do that, and that ended up in a failure. And it shows us that God can act or refrain from acting as he sees fit. God is not our puppet. 
We can't take him and make him do whatever we want him to do. So the Philistines basically took the Ark of the Covenant, and when they took it, they brought it to their temple and put it next to their false god who is called Dagon. This god, I did a little reading to see what Dagon was all about, and Dagon was more like a half-man, half-fish kind of a god. He was the fish god, whatever. And they had carved out this little statue of Dagon, and they put it in a temple, and they worshipped it, and they gave credit to Dagon for so many things. And they took the Ark of the Covenant, this very valuable piece that represented the presence of God, they took it and they put it next to Dagon on the same footing. The next morning, they came to the temple, and what did they see? They saw that Dagon had fallen in front of the Ark of the Covenant in a worship position. Dagon, the fish god, was now worshiping the Ark of the Covenant. So they's like, huh, this is strange. Dagon fell. So they picked up Dagon, their god, and they put him back. They set him back next to the Ark of the Covenant. The next morning, they came back, and Dagon had fallen again. This time worse. His head had fallen off, and his arms had fallen off. And I did a little reading on that, and that was an indication of a loss of power. A loss of power. So their Philistine false god was humiliated, embarrassed, put to shame, and it started putting fear in their hearts. But it didn't stop there. It went beyond that. The Philistines' god had been embarrassed and humiliated, but then something worse started happening. Their towns started being plagued with tumors. People started getting tumors. They were in the city of uh, Ashdod, and so they started panicking and saying, you know what, this is crazy. We're getting all these tumors. What are we going to do? And they made a decision to move it to another city, to the city of Gath. Gath happens to be where Goliath is from. So they moved it to Gath, and guess what happened there? Same exact thing. They started getting tumors in Gath also. So the people of Gath were like, we don't want this thing here. Can you move it? They started moving the ark around like a hot potato. And they moved it now to another place called Ekron. The people of Ekron didn't want it. They're like, don't bring this thing here. And they tried to plead so that the thing wouldn't be brought there. But it was ultimately brought there. And they suffered the same fate in Ekron. They ultimately begged their leaders to please, please, please take this thing away. Do something with this. So after seven months of devastation and getting plagued with all of these tumors and all of this, you know, the wrath of God. The Philistines assembled their priests and their diviners and their magicians and all their people, and they tried to figure out, what do we do with this ark? And they remembered what happened with Pharaoh. They remembered what went on in Egypt, and they thought about it, and they said, you know what? We need to just give this thing back to the God of the Israelites. And they decided, we're going to give it back to him, but not only give it back to him, we're going to give it back to him with gifts and offerings. The ark was initially brought from, brought into the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh. The Levites, who were the priests there, the Israelite priests of Beth Shemesh, who received this, placed the ark, along with those gifts that were sent with it, on this big, large rock. And then, after that, it was brought to a place called kirath Jerim where it stayed there for about 20 years in a man named Abinadab's house. So now it stayed there for about 20 years. But after those 20 years had passed, David had been exalted as king over Israel. God had exalted him as king over Israel. And he made a decision. He says, you know what? He's going to take Jerusalem and build a city as the capital of Israel. And then he named it, uh, he took residence in the fortress and he named it the city of David. And it only made sense for David that in the capital, the capital of Israel, we would bring the ark back, take it from Abinadab's house and bring it back. So this brings us to where we were reading a little while ago, the story where David was transporting the ark and he assembled 30,000 men and he was about to bring the ark to the capital after it had been at Abinadab's house for about 20 years. This was a festive moment. As we saw, I told you that it reminded me of the celebrations that we have here 
the, the music was playing and they were celebrating because everybody was joyous and they were excited because they were bringing the presence of God back home and they were bringing it to the capital. But in the middle of all that festivity, in the middle of all of that uh, enjoyment, the music and the celebration and the worship, the unspeakable happens. The party got stopped. The DJ just scratched the record. Because Uzzah tried to reach out and touch the ark. He thought it was going to fall. It was on a rocky cart, and he thought it was going to fall, so he was trying to save it. He was trying to save it. And God struck him down. Why did Uzzah have to die? At first reading, when we first read this story, this is kind of problematic for a lot of us as Christians because we look at this and we think, well, this is, you know, why was God being so mean? The brother had good intentions. He wasn't doing anything wrong. He was actually trying to do a good thing. He didn't want the Ark of the Covenant, this precious, precious, sacred thing to fall down into the floor and crack and break. He was stepping in and trying to do a good thing, wasn't he? Why would God have to strike him down? Before we can answer that question, there are two very important points that we have to acknowledge. Well, the first is that we have to take God at his word. Three very important points, I'm sorry. We have to take God at his word. And when we take God at his word, there are three things that happen. Number one, we do the work of God the way God wants. Do the work of God the way God wants. I'll tell you what happened with Uzzah. In Numbers chapter 4, God outlines very clearly some specific instructions on how he wants his people to handle the ark. Verses 13 through 15 specifically state this. After giving us extreme details of how he wants things done, he says, they are to remove the ashes from the bronze altar and spread a purple cloth over it. Then they are to place all the utensils used for ministering at the altar, including the fire pans, meat forks, shovels, sprinkling bowls, listen to all the detail. Over it, they are to spread a covering of durable leather and put the poles in place, the poles that were there for them to carry it. After Aaron and his sons have finished covering the holy furnishings, all the holy articles, when the camp is ready to move, only then are the Kohites to come and do the carrying, but they must not touch it or they will die. They must not touch the holy things or they will die. Does that sound familiar to you? That sounds very familiar like what happened in the Garden of Eden. God, God gave us very clear instructions or clear guidance on what would happen if something was done and we took him very lightly. It appears that although Aaron, um, Uzzah may have had good intentions in his heart. He neglected to follow or adhere to God's specific instructions on what he should not have done. Aren't we tempted sometimes to do that? When we're looking at a situation, when we, we're trying to carry out a work or we're trying to do something and we look at it and we try to stick our hands where it doesn't belong, where we think we need to interfere with something that God is doing or something that God has said, and we think we need to put a spin on it and do it our way and do it the way we think it should be done, and we interject our opinion about something that God said. Uzzah probably thought that it was a good thing that he was doing by trying to save the ark from falling, but he had specific instructions. And we know that Uzzah was one, he was one of the kids of Abinadab who was a Levite, so we know that he had grown up learning about how to play that role that he was called to. He knew, he was taught very specifically that he should never, ever put his hands on the ark. There's another incident right before then um, when Moses was distributing um, carts in Numbers chapter 7, verses 6 to 9. It was giving us a picture of how when Moses was distributing carts, he specifically did not give any to the Kohites because they had a different responsibility. It says, so Moses took the carts and oxen and gave them to the Levites. He gave two carts and four oxen to the Gethanites and the, as their work required. And he gave four carts, eight oxen to the Merathites as their work required. 
and they were all under the direction of Ithamar, sons of Aaron, the priests. But Moses did not give any of the Kohites because they were to carry on their shoulders the holy rings for which they were responsible. So they had a different role. They were called to a different task, so they did not receive carts. They were to carry the, the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders using those poles. Uzzah knew that because he grew up learning that, but he disregarded it or took it lightly, and he let his understanding interfere with the parameters that God had set. But he's not the only one that's on the hook. David's not off the hook here. David, as a leader, was also liable because he failed to consult with God and his instructions. When you look at 2 Samuel 5, you see that David consults with God before he goes to war. He asks God at every turn what he should do. But when it came time to transport this ark, we don't see any indication that David was consulting with the priests. He didn't consult with the scriptures. He just made this decision to do this, and he did it his way. And the way that he did it seems all too familiar with the way that the Philistines did it. So sometimes we can carry out the work of God the way that the world does it. If you look at 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 11, the way that the Philistines moved the cart, they placed the ark on a cart along with the chest containing the gold you know, offerings that they were giving to God. And when we look at 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 3, we can see that David moved it in a very similar way. He had it put on a new cart and brought from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ohio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the ark on it, and Ohio was walking out in front of it. Nothing like the description that God said where they were supposed to carry it on their shoulder on the rods. He either didn't consult with the scriptures, didn't consult with the priests, or he just basically took for granted that it's not a big deal. I saw that the Philistines moved it this way and it was completely fine. We see that the world does things this way and they're completely fine. Maybe we should do it that way too because it's more convenient. I can tell you right now that this lesson was very hard for me because I was sitting there thinking I would probably be one of those same people that would fall victim to this because I'm always looking for efficiency. And I told my wife, I said, you know, um, sometimes when she hosts events and she likes to host like parties and invite people over, we always like to entertain, right? And she cooks all day long. She's like slaving and cooking, you know. And I'm thinking, can't we find a more efficient way of doing this? Can't we just pick up the food and sit down and wait for the people? Isn't it really all about just hanging out with the people? I asked her about that one day, and she told me that, you know, part of the whole thing, part of the gift is putting her hands in it, you know? Part of it is the fact that she takes her time to put her foot in that meal. <laughs> but here I come with my bright idea that this would be more efficient, that this would be easier to do. Why don't we just pick something up and do it this way? And this is the way we treat the work of God, isn't it? He gives us instructions on how we should do things, when we should do things, what day we should worship, and how we should worship. But we neglect all those different things because, hey, you know what? That's less convenient. We should do this instead because this makes more sense. This is more efficient. And I have a feeling that that was part of what was going on with them. They were a little bit careless about it. They forgot. They forgot the, the sacred nature of the Ark of the Covenant. And they didn't consult with Scripture or the priests to figure out how they could transport this cart. But you know what makes David a man after God's own heart? is because when David is convicted, when... Things are brought to his attention. He admits it. And he comes to a place of acknowledgement and recognizing that he was wrong. First Chronicles 15, chapter, two, uh, chapter 15, verses 2 to 14, tell us another instance where David was about to move the cart. And let me read to you what it says there. When they were about to move the cart, David said, No! But the Levites may carry the ark of God because the Lord chose them to carry the ark 
of the Lord and to minister before him forever. David assembled all of Jerusalem in Jeru uh, all of Israel in Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord to the place he had prepared for it. He called together all of the descendants of Aaron and Levite. Now look at what he says here in verses 12 to 15. He said to them, you are the heads of the Levitical families. You and your fellow Levites are to consecrate yourselves and bring up the ark to the Lord, the God of Israel, to the place where I have prepared for it. It was because you, the Levites, did not bring it up the first time that the Lord, our God, broke out his anger against us. We did not inquire of him about how to do it in the prescribed way. So the priests and the Levites consecrated themselves in order to bring the ark of the Lord to Israel. And the Levites carried the ark with the poles on their shoulders as Moses has commanded in accordance to the word of the Lord. So the next time around, David understood that we can't be careless about the way we carry out the work of God. The next time around, David was convicted and he felt that, you know what, the reason this happened to us last time was because we did not consult the word of God before carrying out his duties and his work. Uzzah was not the only one that, um, the other point that we have to keep in mind when we ponder that question, why did Uzzah have to die, is that God will do what he says he will do. God will do what he says he will do. He made it clear to them that if they touch the ark, they would die. What kind of a God would go back on his word? What kind of a God would just basically say that and then nothing happens? Uzzah's not the only person that died like that. In 1 Samuel 6, 9, we see another example. After the Philistine has returned the cart, look at 1 Samuel 16, 19. It says, but God struck down some of the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, where it first went, putting 70 of them to death because they looked into the ark. It's clear that God doesn't play games. There's another instance in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, where Aaron's sons were struck down. Yes. Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, took their censers, put fire in them, and added incense, and they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, contrary to his command. So fire came down from the presence of the Lord and consumed them. And they died before the Lord. Moses then said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke when he says, among those who approach me, I will be proved holy. In the sight of all the people, I will be honored. And then Aaron zipped it. He remained silent because he realized that God is not to be played with. God is perfect and he has perfect requirements and he's entitled to request these perfect requirements and failure to take God at his word results in all the mess that we have today. When we look at Adam and Eve, God said to them very plainly that if you eat from this tree, you will die. They didn't take God at his word. They didn't believe what God said, but look what we have now. Now we're crying. Now we're frustrated. Now we're hurt. Now families are separated. Now there's divorce. Now there's abuse. Now there's murder. Now there's, you know, genocide. Now there's disease. Now there's, you know, wars. And we're frustrated with God because we think that that's not nice of you. Why don't you intervene? Why don't you interfere with this? But God told us what would happen. He told us what would happen. But you know what? As we think more about this question of why Uzzah had to die, I want you to see it as an act of grace. I want you to see it as an act of grace. And this may be kind of challenging for us as human beings because we hear something like that and we're thinking, why is that an act of grace? Well, 
Instead of thinking so much about why Uzzah had to die, I want you to shift your focus and figure out why Jesus had to die. The reason Uzzah had to die is because God is a holy God that's not going to go against what he says. All of us would be Uzzahs, deserving of death because all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. And Uzzah was a demonstration of the kind of God and what he requires, which is perfection, perfect obedience. And he illustrated that time and time again to send you a message to allow you to know that he's not going to take shorts. That he's not looking for, I'm trying really, really hard. I'm a really nice person. You know, I mean, I kind of did this, but look, it's not as bad as that guy. That's not what God's looking for. God demands perfection, and he's illustrated that throughout the entire Bible. However, Jesus Christ died because you and I could never deliver that perfection. The cause of death that we should be concerned about is the cause of death of Jesus. We could look at the death of Uzzah and keep focusing on that, but that's a focus on self. It's a focus on humanity. It's a focus that is kind of arrogant. It's a focus that says we deserve certain things from God. We're entitled to God treating us nicely. And we don't believe it when he tells us that the wage of sin is death. We don't believe him when he says that. We need to believe God when he says that the wage of sin is death. We need to take him at his word because whatever he says will happen. When God says that we're going to die, we're going to die. And we need to take God seriously when he speaks. And all of those examples that we see in the Old Testament of these kinds of things happen are us paying the consequences of our sin and our rebellion if we didn't have Jesus. See, this gives us a greater appreciation for Jesus. It allows us to remember that Jesus dying is the only reason why we're not struck down for the thoughts that we have, for the lies that we tell, the pain that we cause one another. That's what Jesus reminds us of, that we are us-us always sticking our hands where it doesn't belong. <laughs> Uzzah probably felt like Alex, you know, a little nervous about that ship. It's going to fall. And a little bit tempted to do something about it, right, Alex? Tempted to stick your hand into it instead of trusting God. You see, do you believe God when he says that... Um, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the people who practice magic arts, the idolaters, the liars, the thieves, the drunkards, the swindlers, the little white liars, and the big black liars, right? <laughs> All the liars will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do you believe that? Do you take God at his word when he says that? Do you believe that they will end up consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur? See, a lot of times we take God very, very lightly, and the stuff that he told us, we look at it and we think it's a joke. Or we don't think about it at all. But God will do what he says he's going to do. And the reason why killing Uzzah is good news is because it proves that God will do what he says he's going to do. Because in addition to saying those things, here are some of the other things that God says that he's going to do. He says that he promises us a new heaven and a new earth. He says that he's going to make his dwelling place among us. He says that he's going to wipe every tear out from our eyes. He says that there's not going to be any more death, no more mourning, no more crying. He promises us that everything is going to be brand new. That all the problems are going to be wiped away. He promises us that. And the death of Uzzah proves that God will do what he said he's going to do. Might make you nervous because it doesn't look like it. 
Looks like the cart is going to fall. Looks like the ark is going to fall in your life, right? Looks like it's going to fall. And you might be tempted to intervene. You might be tempted to stick your hand where it doesn't belong. But we need to do God's work the way God wants. And we need to believe him and take him at his word and know that everything he says will come to pass. See that as good news. See that as amazing news that God never fails what he says. I'd be scared if God didn't do anything about some of the disobedience that took place in the Old Testament. If God was a pushover. If God was just a punk that took all the crap and let everybody do all that and never did nothing about it. He said he was going to kill them, but oh, you know what? I'll let you slide this time. I'll be scared if that's the kind of God we had. Because if he was that kind of God, how do we know that he can deliver on making a brand new earth? How do we know that he can deliver to wipe the tears away and wipe the pain away? How would we have, what assurance would we have that the sacrifice of Jesus paid for our sins? See, you couldn't trust him. So the reason Uzzah had to die is because God is holy and he takes no shorts. If he says that he's going to do it, you better believe him. (laughs) You better believe him. You better believe that what he said he was going to do will come to pass. You know, um, this story, uh, the story of Job, the whole point came up. You know, every time we read that story, the first thing that comes to mind is, you know, why do good things happen? Why do bad things happen, you know, to good people, right? Why do bad things happen to good people? First of all, there's no good people. (laughs) There's no such thing. We're all falling short of the glory of God. There's no good people. But when we ask that question, it's because we have a focus on ourselves and an entitlement of what we feel we deserve from God, right? We're focused on that. You know who asked the right question in that story? Satan. You know what Satan's question was? Why why do people serve you? Isn't it because of all the warm and fuzzy stuff you've given them? You gave them AC, you give them a nice car, you gave them a nice house, you gave them nice... That's why they serve you. See, Satan is putting it really, really out there. Why do you serve God? Are you serving God because he's God? Because he's God. Do you recognize that God doesn't do something because it is good, but something is good because God does it? God, what he does defines the standard of what is good. It's not your opinion on what you think of how it should go. All of a sudden, we took life, which was God's idea. It was God's idea. He created us. He invented us. He gave us taste buds. You like eating? You like chicken? You like that? You like spicy jerk chicken? Like chicken? I like it. Yeah, good stuff, right? Looking forward to that steak, Gilbert. Right? I love it. But who invented taste buds? Who created me with the taste buds to enjoy that? Who created me with the ability to laugh? Who created me with the ability to enjoy this life that I'm so attached to all of a sudden? Then all of a sudden, I know better what's right for this life than the person whose idea it was to begin with. Right? See, and so we come up with this question, well, why do bad things happen to good people? That's not the question. The question is, why do you serve God? And the person who had it right was Job. Job said this. This is what he said. He said, shall we accept good from God and not trouble? You see? And then God came and confirmed that this was the right way of looking at things in Job chapter 42, verse 7. After the Lord said all these things to Job, he said to Eliphaz and Temamite, I am angry with you and your friends because you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. You see, Job got it. Job understood that we worship God not because God does things the way we like him to do. Job understood that we worship God not because God is going to make the decisions the way we think the decisions should be made, but we worship God because he's God. And we have to be prepared, like the pastor says earlier in the Garden of Prayer, we have to be prepared to accept any situation that we are handed 
That's what it means to be God. He has his reasons for permitting certain things to happen. He has his reasons for permitting the Israelites to lose the battle that they lost. He has his reasons for allowing you to win or to lose. He has his reasons. But they thought that they could fix the fight by bringing the ark with them. And God showed them it doesn't work that way. Acknowledging God as truly sovereign is to release control to him. Release control to him and recognize that even when things don't look like they're going your way, you got to do God's work the way God wants. Uzzah thought that the cart was about to tumble and fall. The reality is that they were all guilty in that moment and they all should have been struck down because David brought them into a bad situation to begin with as a leader. And it shows us as leaders, you know, we're responsible to make sure we consult with God. And I think that's one of the problems in our world today is that the leaders, the people in a power position, don't consult with God before they do what they're going to do. And they bring us into these terrible situations and we start doing all kinds of crazy stuff like Uzzah does in the middle of it. But we're in a bad situation to begin with because we weren't supposed to be out there carrying it on a cart to begin with like the world does. We were supposed to carry it on rods on our shoulders, but we did what was convenient because it looked easy and the world showed us that it was more appealing and we did it like the world. And many people lose their lives in that process. Many people lose their lives doing that. And very often it's because the leadership didn't consult with God and they brought them out there doing the wrong thing to begin with. So we learn so much from this story but we find so much grace in the story because we realize that now we can trust God. Now when we can trust that all the amazing things that God has promised us, he will deliver. He will deliver. Please join me for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that you are perfect and we recognize that you deserve perfection you don't deserve anything less than what you created. Perfection. You created us perfect and we need to come back to you perfect, but we could never be restored. We could never be reconciled if it weren't for the work of Jesus Christ. So we thank you, Father, for that work because we know that we would be doomed because we are all others. Tempted to try to fix the problem that we created by our own hands. So we thank you that you made a provision and we accept that provision, Father. We accept it. We embrace it. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the sacrifice that saves us, the blood that washes us, that cleanses us, that redeems us. We thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Maybe uh, my wife, uh, Craig, was just, Craig says he wants to have a special prayer for you. So I know during the whole service, my wife's been in a lot of pain. And, um, and Craig has been moved to have a prayer for her. God said. God said. God said. <laughs> It's okay for grown men to cry. Yes. You just don't know how special this woman is to the kingdom. And I struggle. But I sense you were in pain. Marva and Valerie, please come up. I want you to touch her. God is holy. God is holy. is holy mother wife mother wife you've been praying a long long time nobody doesn't know the struggle not even your husband knows the pain 
your husband does not even know your pain. Not just the physical, but the emotional. Anna, God loves you, Jesus. He said, get up and pray for now. Get up. <sighs> He's going to touch you. Stand between these two. Come from pastor and just stand between them, Mervyn. And, and I, and I say this because, oh God, Jesus, Father, Valerie and Merva, y'all put your hand on her chest area, like just, just touch, just touch her. Is, is it the stomach? Is, is it the stomach area? The, put, put your hand on the back, the back. Touch the back, Valerie. You touch her chest, and Merva, you put your hand on her back. Father, Father, God, I shake, Father, Father, your daughter, your servant, Anna, Father, Father, in the name of Jesus, Yahusha Christ, by your stripes, she is healed. The 39 lashes on your back for every lash a healing. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Father, Father, Father. Father, Father, Father. Father, Father. Father, we stand, we stand, and we cry for Anna. Father, 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 in the name of Jesus, Yeshua. From the crown of her head to the sole of her feet now. From the crown of her head to the soles of her feet now. Every sickness, every disease, every pain die. Every sickness, every pain, every disease die now for these past 10, 15 years she has been suffering. Father, Father, you know the pain, Jesus. Oh my God. Daddy, Abba, Father, your daughter, your servant, wife, mother, Father. In the name of Jesus, Father. We speak healing, deliverance. Father, we speak to the pain, the sickness, the disease in her bone, in her joints, in the lower back, the lumbar. Go now, disc line up. Cartilage, cartilage be made whole. The lumbar in the back to look, be made whole now. The vertebrae correct, 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 restored, restored in Jesus' name. We speak to it. We speak to it. Father, your word says that you should tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the work of the enemy. Father, today in the name of Jesus, we come against the work of the enemy. We come against the work of the enemy and your servant daughter. Now, we speak healing. We speak deliverance, pain, go. Healing and restoration now. Now in the lower lumbar back region, right now, I command those vertebrae. I command those vertebrae to be restored. Jesus, Father, 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 I ask for your touch. Father, touch her as Valerie and Merva ministers and holds. Father, touch, touch. Jesus, Jesus, my God, and I thank you for the obedience of your servant son. The obedience of your servant son right now. This man who you have called. And let everyone be a nun who says he is not. 
and let everyone be a nun who says he is not. Father, Father, thank you for his obedience. Thank you for his ministry. Thank you for this woman you have given me who Satan has tried to bind all these years. Be free, be made whole. As you said, Yeshua, on that day in the temple, you said this woman who Satan has bound these 18 years, shall she not be made free today? We speak Anna Labrador free. In Jesus name, free from every pain, free from every sickness, free from every disease. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, Anna, your father loves you. Your father will move heaven and earth for you. Your father, Yahuwah, Yahweh our God shall move heaven and earth for you. Hear his servant, hear his servant son. He shall move heaven and earth for you. He has moved heaven and earth in Jesus' name. As, um, and, uh, you know, that's why this morning you came to church, right? That's why this morning were you thinking, should we go or not go, right? <laughs> Remember that moment, right? Should we go or not go today? You know? I, I don't know. Well, this, this is why you came to church today. God has been speaking to us all from the beginning. Powerful sermon. Powerful sermon, Carl, today. Powerful, powerful. Powerful sermon. Uh, awesome sermon. Uh, and this is, this is why you came to church. You know, as Carl was preaching today and, and I was watching him preach and I was, uh, you know, everything that goes on in our church with a praise team and, and all these things, I was, I was sitting there thinking, you know, you know, you guys don't know, but, uh, you know, I've been, you know, different people have reached out to me as origin and they seen what God has done with us. And, and you know, and they wanted to, they've always been trying to get me to join these uh, other umbrellas, go under the umbrella of other churches and to, and to join these, you know, organizations and how much they could help our church to grow you know, become a big mega church and, and, uh, you know, and they're constantly trying to reach out to me. You know, you could, we could invite you to other churches to preach and you could go to different parts of the world because we, we could use you, you know, to preach to other people and you could go, you could travel, you could do all these things, you know, and if you become part, you know, of, of, uh, this and, uh, that's not why we decided to do Origin. I will not never give up what we have here as a church, as a small church for anything else. Uh, what we do here, what Craig was just able to do, what we do with Garden of Prayer, you can't do this in a big church. You can't do it. You can't do it. It's, it's, every, everything becomes mechanical. Everything becomes, you know, and, uh, and that's not what I ever uh, maybe that's what people thought I wanted to do at the beginning you know I wanted to become you know a big old big time uh, minister and pastor and all these things but I would never give up what we have here as a church and if you are part of this church I want you to know that you're part of something special you're part of something special uh, that you don't get in many places and um, so we thank God for that we thank God for our church um, wanted to remind you, you see the up there about a picnic picnic coming up tomorrow at 3 at, at, at uh, Royal Palm Beach Commons Park take Southern Boulevard to Royal Palm Beach and, uh, and drive north of Royal Palm Beach and the, and the Commons Park will be on the right you go in there just go straight down we'll be on the right hand side 
there tomorrow at uh, at three o'clock. Uh, we're gonna be there to uh, two. Yeah. Okay. Let's make it three. Let's make it three. Uh, it's hot. It's hot, and three is gonna be a little bit too too early. It's gonna be hot out there, and uh, we do have sun till about eight eight thirty. So uh, let's make it three three o'clock. Uh, be there. Uh, and, uh, and don't worry about the rain, okay? Don't worry about it. Nah, don't worry about it. It's going to be good. Isn't it, you know, it's, inc- it's interesting that you look at the rain, you can look at the weather in West Palm Beach for the next seven days, and the only days that only has 20% chance of rain is tomorrow. All the others have about 60, 70% chance of rain, but tomorrow is only 20 because we got to have our picnic. So... Uh, we'll see. So it, and then we need all of you to talk to Sita because we ha- we need food there. Okay, we need food. So please tell Sita what you're bringing tomorrow. Tell Sita what you're bringing so we don't have too much of one thing. Tell Sita what you're bringing, and she'll also let you know some of the stuff we need. So please help us out with that. Uh, we're also planning to have a concert on September 25th, outdoor concert, okay? So we can start promoting that. We can start announcing that. We haven't made a flyer for it or anything, but I know uh, I know that September 25th, we're planning to have a concert. So uh, it's going to be outdoor uh, also. We also want to announce uh, September, I mean, October 29th, we're going to have a couple's seminar a couple seminar at the hotel here in delray beach so uh, those of you want to talk uh, carl do you have the information for that for them because we we've assigned it we go to the website right uh, how are they going to know that carl on our facebook page there's a uh, there's a link that would allow you to save a hundred dollars per couple a hundred dollars per couple if you use our co- our uh, discount code which is Origin Church. The discount code is Origin Church with no spaces, just type Origin Church, and it'll take $100 off per couple. So it's gonna be from the Friday the 29th through Sunday the 31st. Uh, I forget the name of the hotel, that's not up there. The name of the hotel. Yeah, it'll be on the link. It'll be yeah. on the link, it's on the link. All the information is on, yeah. the, on our Facebook page. Yeah. So you'll find it there, you and click you, on that link. <laughs> and you don't have to stay in the hotel. You can save that money if you want. You just come and go to the to the seminars. Though it's going to be at the at the at the hotel, uh, and some some of us may want to live out the whole experience and stay at the hotel. So if you want to do that, that'd be great. It's singles uh, event as well. And then yeah. also on that sandwich. same weekend, we are planning a singles event uh, here at the church, and uh, so we we want to. Uh, uh, you know, we want you guys to also have, have something. Hey, and if you guys want to do it at a hotel, you can do that hotel too. Okay, you know. They do, they do have rooms with just one bed. Or just single, you know? So anyway, so if you want, you want to do that, that's, 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 that's fine. We can do, but we want to make sure that we can, we can satisfy both, both groups. Uh, so we're working on that. We got, uh, we got uh, Merva and Fern are going to be working on that. Merva and Fern are going to be working on that. So, so uh, we expect to have something special September 20. October. October 29th. And Pastor Oops. Allen's going to do the singles. Uh, we're, we're still working on that. Oh, we're okay. still working okay. on that. We're, we're still working on that. Uh, but anyway, people, thank you so much for everything that you do. We have men's and women's ministry uh, this this Sunday. We have it, uh, men, just men's ministry, uh, this coming Sunday at 8.30 uh, a.m. You can go on WebEx, uh, meeting room A, and men's ministry will be studying there together. Uh, we're all going to be leading that out uh, this at, uh, at 8.30. At 9 o'clock, I'll jump off for a little bit and do our devotional that we do at 9 and then at 7 and then we go on the rest of the week 9 a.m. and 7 p.m. Uh, we do our devotionals and in our devotionals we just finished up the book of Isaiah 
We did a whole 66 chapters of the book of Isaiah. We didn't do everything verse by verse, but we went through it and we've, uh, we've done that. Uh, since the pandemic started, we've done like seven or eight books of the Bible uh, already going, going through it. So we, we invite you to that. Thank you for uh, being with us here today. And thank you for that. We also have our, um, our uh, giving, our giving. We thank you for the giving, originchurch.com. You can go there to give. You can also go on your phone and type uh, 561-462-5932. You, you put that in. And in the text area, you put that in the text area and you text the word give. Once you text the word give, it'll ask you for your information one time. And if you have that, then you type the amount you want to give and it's done. After that, you don't have to type your information anymore, your second and third, or from there on. You just have to go in that text and write the amount, and that's it. You're done. Thank you for your giving. Uh, Origin has been blessed so much. Though we're a small church, we're big givers. And this has been a blessing to so many people, so many people in our community, and to each one of us. Thank you very much. May God bless you. Have an amazing Sabbath. Remember, this is the Sabbath, the day of the Lord. He's asked you to separate this day for him. Make sure we keep it for him. God bless you and have a great day.